Uh, good morning, and I'd like to welcome members to the third meeting of the 28, of 2018 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, I note this morning we have apologies from Elaine Smith, MSP. Uh, our first agenda item is an evidence session on the committee's inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct. And joining us today are our first panel, Professor Nicole Busby, Professor of Labour Law from the University of Strathclyde and Kirsty Thompson, Solicitor from Just Right Scotland and the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. And thank you for coming along this morning. Um, if I may start, uh, Professor Busby, your submission talked about the visibility of policies on sexual harassment and the importance of support for the policies by leadership. Can you maybe expand a little bit on why this is important? Yes, um, I think it, it's important because um, What's lacking in lots of policies that I've looked at, not, not just the one that, that I looked at in relation to the, the Parliament, um, but more generally in workplaces and in other parliamentary um, contexts, is the, a sort of naming of sexual harassment, an identification of what it is. Um, because when we look at issues to do with reporting um, and responses to uh, allegations, we see that there's lots of misunderstanding and misconception um, and I think that that is unnecessary because it's clearly identified in law um, and actually the legal definition is quite broad. It could be used very specifically in policy, um, but it does need to be named. I think it's no use hiding it away or dealing with it under a general sort of dignity at work policy, which is what generally tends to happen in lots of organisations, because it is specific. And we're seeing now, with everything that's coming into the public domain, um, that it's pernicious. You know, it's a widespread problem. It's very difficult to deal with. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that it is, in policy terms, often quite hidden, I think. So it's about naming it, identifying it, and making very clear what sorts of behaviour it covers, um, and raising awareness of that. Um, and, and sort of taking ownership of, of responding and dealing with that adequately. And then pre pre preparing for today, um, I take it that you looked at some of the policies that the Scottish Parliament has currently. Did you feel that they met that standard that you're talking about? I think it's, to be honest with you, I didn't know. I, I looked at the policies, I tried to identify where it would be dealt with in different contexts in the parliamentary policies and I actually found it quite difficult to do. Um, and I looked at some of the evidence presented or submitted by other organisations, and that was a common finding, actually, because I thought, is it just me? Um, but it tended to run through the evidence that others had submitted uh, to the committee, um, that actually it's quite difficult to identify where the reporting procedures are, um, you know, where um, individuals who are facing uh, difficulties would go, uh, in terms of policy, um, and then there are some areas of um, quite misleading information in some of the policies. So I think it is something that definitely needs to be to be looked at um, in detail um, in terms of your current uh, policies and procedures. Certainly, that that is a, a concern that's been raised by the committee and by by other witnesses about trying to navigate your way through yes, through the policy. Exactly. One other thing that you had raised in your um, written evidence was um, you spoke about examples of good practice from other parliaments in um, yes. Canada and Denmark. Yeah. Um, I wonder if perhaps you could expand on that. One of the things that the committee has been trying to get from, from witnesses when they've, they've come along is, is examples of, of other areas, other industries even, that have, have uh, sure. good policies that, are, that um, we can learn from. So perhaps you could um, give the committee some information on, on, on these examples of good practice. Sure. Um, before I do that, I would say that um, actually when you start to look, I, I did have a general sort of search for um, examples of good practice, particularly in parliamentary procedure. It's very difficult to find examples of good practice. Um, what you do uncover when you start to dig around is that this is a problem which is widespread. Um, most parliaments in all parts of the world have, have faced issues to do with sexual harassment, so it's not unique to any particular culture, any particular country, any particular part of the world. Um, there was a very interesting study done by the Interparliamentary um, the Interparliamentary Union, I think they're called, in 2011, which I did uh, reference in my evidence, which wasn't just to do with sexual harassment, but looked at what they called gender-sensitive parliaments. And they did lots of surveys. They, they looked at over 70 different parliamentary uh, institutions across the world. Um, and they found that sexual harassment policies are the least 
likely form of policy that parliaments have. You know, they're the least common form of gender-related policies um, across the world. So I thought that was quite an interesting finding. When you try to look for good examples or examples of good practice, difficult to find, I think, because the problem is endemic, and I don't think any parliament can hold themselves up to say, we are dealing with this or we have dealt with this perfectly. I think it's a learning curve for as I say, countries around the world, um, the two examples that came up, and they're different examples, they, they, have, they bring different things, I think, to the, to the landscape. Um, it, uh, Canada and Denmark, I'll speak about Canada first, because that's more closely related to um, a sort of parliamentary procedure of the sort that you might be uh, looking for. Um, so in Canada, they spent, I think it's two years developing and implementing a particular policy on uh, sexual, well, they called it preventing and addressing harassment. So it's more general, but it does specify sexual harassment very clearly and identifies what that is and what sorts of behaviours would be covered there in the way that I mentioned earlier that would be useful. Um, in 2014, they introduced a, a, a long policy. It's 19 pages long, so it's quite detailed. Um, and what it does, I think, interestingly, is it covers, as well as talking about harassment and the specific issues there, it talks about abuse of authority and harassment. So it brings in that power dynamic, which, again, is very clear in all the evidence, I think, that you've received, the written evidence that I've seen, um, that it is an issue of a, an abuse of power. And so it links it very clearly to that. And that's missing, actually, in lots of organisational policies. So I think that's very helpful to frame it in that way. And that's what the Canadian uh, House of Commons policy does. Um, it's still, you know, it came in in 2014. It's, it's still a work in progress, I think. Um, what they have done is that you've seen the Prime Minister of Canada give some very high profile speeches and statements about sexual harassment in society generally, and also in the context of the Parliament. So there's real leadership being shown there for the implementation of that that detailed policy. Um, is it effective? I think it's really difficult to tell. They have got high, quite high incidence of reporting, as far as I can gather, but that might show the success of the policy. If you, you know, once you start seeing lots of reporting, that, that you might take that as a success in this context. Um, and under-reporting, obviously, you know, where there, oh, there's no issues of, of that type within our parliamentary structure, I'd be suspicious of that. Um, and it would probably it, it indicate that there were problems with the policies and procedures that the Parliament had, because we know that this happens everywhere. So the Canadian example is an interesting one. Um, it's worth looking at. It's detailed, as I say, but I really like the link between the abuse of authority and harassment, that clear link, and the leadership shown by the Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, and others over ownership um, of that policy and awareness raising. Denmark is a different case. Um, in Denmark, I think the general attitude or the, the, the general um, engagement with issues around sexual harassment is, very, is a very interesting approach. It comes from the wider um, Nordic working environment conception. So harassment in Denmark and in other Nordic countries is seen as an issue of health and well-being, which I think it should be. Um, and it's really placed in that broad context. And I'm not sure that the Parliament necessarily has strong practices and procedures, and they have had issues again reported, which are in the public domain, of problems uh, with sexual uh, harassment. But it's, part, it's, it's placed very broadly in uh, national measures, which take a very proactive approach and which are very widely scoped. So they cover public authorities, um, all employment uh, in the private and public sector, um, and it's all about taking steps to avoid sexual harassment. So the onus is very much placed on the employer or the person responsible uh, or the party responsible. And sexual harassment is defined as injury to the recipient. Um, and there is a, a compensation scheme in place, which deals quite speedily, actually. Once a case has been proved, there's access to compensation uh, for the victim. Um, but it's part of a much broader national strategy um, on the elimination of gender inequality generally, um, which covers all aspects of public and private life. And that's maybe another point that I did make it in the written evidence, but I'd stress that again. You can't just pick out sexual harassment and deal with it in isolation. It's part of a much broader structural 
um, and societal problem. Um, and it really impinges on all aspects of working, working life, public life, private life. And I think it has to be understood in that broader context, again, going back to uh, issues of, of power and power imbalances. Um, so the Denmark example, the Danish example is different from Canada, not quite specific, more general, and really to do with their, their um, holistic approach, I think, to issues of gender equality generally. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure the clerks will uh, find the, the, both of those policies and, and uh, share them with the, the committee. It would be really interesting to, to have a look at those in the context of what we're doing. Um, Kate. Thanks very much, Emma. Thanks for giving evidence this morning. I wanted to talk briefly about implementation. So being able to, on one hand, draft um, good policies that instill trust, but there being a, a gap with the actual implementation of those policies. And a, a victim or a survivor's first port of call is normally their line manager. What do you think should be done to ensure that line managers are equipped properly to assist and to understand how to best support the person who has uh, come to them with information? Um, I mean, I think, again, it's about training, it's about awareness raising, it's about naming sexual harassment, explaining what it is very clearly. And I think anyone who's in a supervisory or management capacity has to have some form of equalities training at which that is, in which that is central. Um, so I think it's definitely about um, making sure that everyone in an organisation knows what sexual harassment is, uh, not just the legal definition, because I think we want to be much broader than that, actually, in day-to-day in -day life, but the legal definition is, is a pretty good starting point. It's fairly comprehensive. Um, but it's also about giving examples. And again, policy can help with that, but you're right, implementation is key. Policies can just be left on paper um, and actually not put into action at all. So it is about awareness raising. It's about leadership at the very top of the organisation to show the importance um, with which these issues are taken. Um, and I think constantly reviewing and monitoring, I think that again has to be done. And information which does arise in that process has to be made uh, in statistical form publicly available um, so that we know what we're dealing with um, and that everyone in the organisation is aware of uh, the extent of, of the problem. But I mean, Kirsty might want to say more, I don't know, about implementation. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me today. Um, <clears throat> yes, I can, I guess, speak about it from the perspective of women who contact the centre and the kind of things that they will bring up. And that is a common complaint, um, that actually there are very good policies um, that tick all the boxes, but there have been failures in implementation. And my perspective on it are that those failures come from the same failures that face the complainer. Because if there is a lack of clarity in what we're naming, if there is a lack of clarity in what requires to be done and how, then that will also impact on the person that's meant to deal with it. Because they will also suffer from that same lack of clarity in terms of what should happen, when and how. Um, and then where to refer that person to any other, um, any other access. So it's... De it's, it's a similar issue, lack of clarity, which then leads to a lack of confidence in terms of knowing how to respond. Um, and that comes back to, again, clarity of procedures, but also training and leadership. Convener, do you want me to continue asking my questions, which may be on a slightly different subject, or do you want to take supplementaries on that? Uh, no, no. Fine. The other, the other question I have is around uh, support for both the the person, the complainer, and also the perpetrator. So in terms of either counselling or just walking with them through the process and ensuring that there is um, some sort of support available. What are your views on A, what support should be available to both parties? And secondly, um, whether you see failings in that not being available currently? Actually, I'll go, I, I will go first. Um, due to the complexity of um, sexual harassment, the complexity of the processes and procedures that, that apply, and the potential consequences for everyone, um, it is essential that some kind of support 
is available. And I'll primarily speak from the complainer's um, point of view. Um, more often than not, that is why they contact the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. They're looking for access. Um, they're looking for information. They're looking for impartial um, advice. Um, so um, it would be my position that some kind of independent specialist support would require to be available. And it's about navigation and about advocacy and a point of communication through that process. Um, and likewise, I mean, I, again, I mean, I can speak more for the complainer's point of view, but at the same time, if a woman, um, you know, requires a, a response, um, she also wants um, her complaint to be handled along the principles of natural justice, um, so that when there is a decision, that decision is a robust decision that can then lead on to a robust sanction, and that will mean um, access to support for that for for the, the the other person in the process um the only thing i'd add to that is that i, th I think I, I completely agree with what kirsty has said um but i think sexual harassment we know it's a particular problem it's a specific problem i think in terms of the um, the person making an allegation. It should be dealt with sensitively and in line with a specific policy. I would stress that. I think for someone who's being accused um, of uh, an action or behaviour, generally speaking, in my experience, things like dignity and respect policies are quite good, actually. At, you know, They usually have built into them support mechanisms and procedures for dealing with those who are accused of particular behaviours, whether it's in this context or in the, a broader context. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that there's much that needs to be added. If you've got a good dignity and respect policy in place with procedures attached to that, I think that that usually would suffice. Um, but I think where we're talking about people making allegations uh, in this context because of the nature and the severity and the extent of the problem, it really should be uh, dealt with under a specific policy. Just a really a brief point around uh, gagging clauses um, and confidentiality. How does that help or hinder the sort of softer support for both the um, complainer and the perpetrator? Um, again, I um, um, will speak first. Um, and again, from the, our experience um, on the Scottish Women's Rights Centre, um, that is the key cause for complaint. Um, from a woman, um, and of, they tend to arise through an employment tribunal procedure and process, where for a variety of reasons, a negotiation or settlement is reached, um, and a woman often feels um, that she hasn't got the remedy um, that she was wishing in that regard. Um, often, um, she will require to leave her position, and the the perpetrator is still there. So she feels that there has been no um, access to justice effectively, and actually nothing has really happened. Um, in the context of, of members and what you're looking at, um, I mean, it's, um, it obviously covers employment <coughs> law, but if we're naming something and um, there are, an, you know, an independent investigation, and there's conduct issues that get brought back um, to a committee to look at. It would be my position that confidentiality in that regard wouldn't be appropriate. It wouldn't send the right message. It wouldn't send. Um, it wouldn't be robust. Um, if I look at it from my own regulatory body, um, if a solicitor is to do something that is would, would you know amount to professional misconduct, for instance, then my um, body could ultimately name and shame by removing me from whatever or by, um, by, by, by naming me. That is what a robust sanction um, does. That, that's its aim. And I guess it's that difference between looking at an employment tribunal process and then, and then something else, which is around about conduct and investigation. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about sanctions, and uh, as you've you've brought it up, I'll, I'll maybe just sort of uh, follow on from there. Um, 
I'd like to hear both of your perspectives on, on what the issues are that we should be considering in terms of the, the range of sanctions. But just to, just to tease it out a wee bit, we have a complex landscape here where there, there might be situations that involve, for example, members of the, the staff of the corporate body, in which case it's pretty comparable to any other big organisation. There might be a situation that involved um, a contractor, a, a third party organisation, a member of the media, a member of the public who was here. There might be a situation that involved um, MSPs only, uh, either as people complaining or being complained about, and, and a matter might be dealt with inside a parliamentary group as an internal matter. Uh, or there might be something that was escalated to a, uh, a formal complaint coming to the Commissioner and to this committee uh, in terms of breach of the Code of Conduct. Uh, and in which case, again, there are potentially low-level sanctions, if you like. At the other extreme, there might be uh, criminal charges involved for the most severe behaviour. And in the middle, uh, a question about whether there's a gap around something that in other workplaces might be seen as uh, requiring dismissal for gross misconduct, but for which there's no comparable penalty or sanction that can be issued against an MSP. Um, can you help us cut through any of that? Sorry, that's quite a lot to throw at you all at once, but um... I, think it's, I think it's very, <laughs> I think it's very difficult. I think this is where we really um, uh, hit a difficulty here in the way that the, even in the way that the law operates in relation to employment. I mean, Kirsty's already mentioned the difficulties that complainants can have um, when they enter the employment tribunal system and are asked to sign confidentiality agreements in terms of settlements and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I'd like to say that for staff, where there's a staff issue and it's an issue or a matter of employment law, which is, I suppose, my um, sort of specialist area, um, that uh, robust uh, disciplinary and grievance procedures should be able to deal with that effectively. But I think, again, um, that has to run alongside a very robust and clear specialist policy on uh, sexual harassment itself. Um, so in terms of sanctions, I mean, there's lots of guidance there for the employment relationship and what should happen. Um, and it goes up to, as you say, gross misconduct um, and dismissal um, would be the sanction uh, in that context. Um, it becomes much muddier when we start to talk about third parties even. Uh, they can be covered and should be covered certainly by policies. Um, but in terms of sanctions against third party, actions under the Equality Act against third parties were part of the original plan, but they were, that um, sort of action was repealed. So you can't any longer take an action under the Equality Act against a third party for harassment. Um, so that's something that maybe ought to be looked at in terms of the law, but I know that equality is um, a reserved matter. Um, and in terms of MSPs, codes of conduct, um, where you've, you're talking about something which is outside of the employment relationship, if, if the activity or the behaviour relates to MSPs solely, I think that's a really difficult uh, area of regulation. Um, what should the sanctions be in that case? I mean, I'm all for um, something parallel to um, dismissal for MSPs in the most severest cases. I don't see why that shouldn't be an option. Uh, it certainly could be built into a, a policy or procedure. Um, just on the issue of codes of conduct generally, I would say um, that there's a danger in just leaving this to uh, matters of ethics and saying, well, we'll deal with it as an ethical matter or as something uh, pertaining to um, good behaviour. I think there's an assumption there that everyone knows uh, what those things are. Um, and of course, we've already spoken about the specificities here and the, the, the need to name and specify this type of behaviour. And if you're talking about good behaviour perceived or established good behaviour, you're then moving into a sort of normative framework and I think that can be confusing because actually some of the norms we know, not just uh, in parliaments in the, the, the Scottish context or the Westminster context, but around the world, normative behaviour is not necessarily the best basis on which to, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to base or frame good practice. So I, th I think there's something there that definitely needs to be specified. Um, and in terms of sanctions, I can't see why you can't build in a very similar type of sanctions um, framework 
to that which would pertain to um, employment, not even in the legal context, but in terms of good, robust in-house workplace policies and procedures, disciplinary and grievance procedures, as recommended by ACAS. Um, I don't know if Kirsty might have more. Let me ask Kirsty in, in just a moment, but can I just check that I understood something that, that you were saying, yeah. uh, Professor Busby? Uh, you mentioned the Code of Conduct, and I wasn't quite clear if you were saying that um, the issue of sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour should be uh, more clearly defined in the Code of Conduct so that action can be taken against breaches, or that it should be dealt with outside of the context in a different way than the Code of Conduct, which, you know, breaches of which go to the Commissioner and then to this committee for a, a decision? Yeah. Um, I don't have a clear view on either, if I'm honest with you, but I think it has to be specified and it has to be made. I mean, I, I think where we start to get opaque about this and talk about ethic, you know, it's about ethical behaviour or good practice or good behaviour, and everyone knows what those standards are, I think there's a danger there that actually everyone doesn't know what those standards are. So again, it's got to be specified what sorts of behaviours we're talking about, whether that's within the, the, the framework of the existing code of conduct um, or in a separate sort of policy, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm really in position to advise, but it's something that probably should be looked at um, in, in detail, I think. Okay. Could I put the same issues to, to Kirsty Thompson? <clears throat> yes. Um, um, again, um, sanctions are very important, and again, clarity of sanctions. Um, um, and again, from our perspective, and when a woman's deciding whether to engage on any route or any process, um, the ultimate result or what she can expect is a very important part of that. Is she prepared to risk X, Y and Z for, for whatever um, the sanction is? And when, as a, if a woman was to approach me um, um, from the parliament or from the, the procedures and processes that you have in place, I would find it probably quite, quite difficult to navigate or provide information that would allow her to navigate through what process that would result in what sanction. And I guess it comes down to the complexities of the spectrum of sexual harassment, which, which you've mentioned, but also the number of actors that are involved in the different um, legal um, areas and processes that that, that, that links to. For me, when I looked at it, I thought there required to be one policy, one clear policy that all actors of, of Parliament, uh, members, etc., signed up to, and that the code then referred to that as it as it does. Um, because for me, there was just too many actors, too many parts in play that setting and i'm not saying this will be easy but it's what it but for me it's it's what's demanded for someone um for a woman in this situation a clear policy um for everyone involved this we're naming what sexual harassment is we're going to give it some practical life um in terms of what that means now um this is the route this is the point of contact that you can have this is how it will then be investigated and then this, the decision from that will go to X, Y, and Z. And this is the range of sanctions that could apply um, and robust sanctions, albeit different parts um, of the, the parliament as a whole might need to take different decisions in that. The decision-making process or the, or the experience of what practically happens in different scenarios might be different. It would relate to a, a, a single document, I guess, a single uh, stated black and white position on how Parliament culturally wishes to deal with these issues. And that would relate to potentially contractors, it would relate to uh, organisations who were running an event here, it would relate to Parliament staff and to, and to MSPs it would and say, somehow be hooked into the Code of Conduct. Yeah, it would set out for me, and again, looking at it from the perspective um, of a woman, it would set out, it would name, it would set out clear expectations and then buy in from each other aspect. And each other process or procedure may then need to, okay. to be amended. But for me, there are too many moving pieces and too many moving actors that some clarity requires to be to be put in place yeah. somewhere. And if one part has clarity, but the other two parts <coughs> don't. Sure. 
Thank you. That's helpful. Um, just just briefly, if I can uh, follow up with with each of you on on that that last point that I, I raised when when I opened this this question around dismissal uh, and in relation to MSPs, there is no facility unless someone has been convicted of a of a qualifying offence uh, and sentenced. Um, there is no facility for um, behaviour that falls short of that standard to result in dismissal. Now, I know that at Westminster, uh, there's a um, facility for recall. Um, I'm not sure how familiar what you are with that, that process, but it involves a, a petition potentially of 10% of the constituency electorate of the MP. Uh, f uh, and, and if that threshold is reached, then you would have a, a, a re-election, a, a, a by-election. It does seem to me that putting an issue like sexual harassment to a public contest in that way would be not only unseemly, but quite risky in terms of, of uh, effectively asking the public, uh, is this one all right or is that one not all right? And quite a, a kind of, um, a, a, again, a lack of clarity for a person complaining about what would happen as a result of that process and a lack of clarity if different decisions were made in, in different circumstances seems to me that that mechanism might be appropriate for a political breach of trust, like breaking a manifesto promise that people are angry about, but not necessarily for something like this. Would that be your view as well? And is there another way of reaching a similar uh, a similar type of, of kind of ultimate sanction for something that's short of criminal conduct? I agree with you about using... I don't think that the, the recall procedure or process... Um, that Westminster would use um, would work in this context for the reasons that you said. Um, something in its place. Um, I think it's difficult because, of course, if we're looking at dismissal, you're talking there, the, the parallel there, the existing uh, context for dismissal would be um, conviction of a criminal offence. Um, and I don't think we should say in this context you have to go through um, a court procedure, a, 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 a tribunal procedure or other civil action um, because, of course, you're then putting the onus on the individual complainant um, because it's party-party litigation. You're asking that person to go through that process in order to get some kind of res you know, legal adjudication. I think that's, that's wrong, although that may happen uh, in, in this context as well. Um, so I think, again, it comes back to having robust procedures um, and being responsible, f if you like, for um, regulating behaviour within the parliament. Um, and I think if you have procedures um, on which um, those sorts of judgments can be made after full um, investigation and, and, you know, in line with, with, with timely uh, procedures and so on, I don't see why uh, dismissal shouldn't be an option um, for someone who has committed uh, an act of sexual harassment, a, a serious offence of sexual harassment. And, you know, I, I don't, I think it's difficult, again, then we have then to get into areas of quantifying, if that's the right word, different types of behaviour. And that's difficult to do because, as we know from, even the legal standard says it's the effect um, or the impact that, that is that the recipient uh, is felt by the recipient. So I think it's difficult to to have different gradations um, of behaviours, but I think that it has to be looked at as an option, um, something in line with dismissal, something that would, and and as part of a robust procedure and, and process. Um, yes, um, yes. Um, I hadn't realised that about um, ten percent of constituents, and it would seem for the most serious of a sexual harassment action, um, it wouldn't seem appropriate to put that to constituents, and it would seem to be at odds with the desire to take leadership. Um, and having said that, um, when we talk about robust sanctions, I do think there should be the, an ultimate sanction um, equivalent to dismissal however that is arrived at or achieved. Um, I'm aware in saying that, however, that, um, you know, there are, um, 
that rule's there for a reason in terms of democracy, etc. If someone is dismissed through an employment process, there is a whole um, structure of um, ability to go to tribunal, review processes, etc. So I do agree that there should be an ultimate, ultimate sanction, but that would then demand that the procedure that leads up to that is robust with opportunity. Um, you know, it must show procedural justice, equality of justice, um, inbuilt review and appeal mechanisms. If that ultimate sanction is then going to be is then going to be utilised. Thank you both. Yeah, Jamie, do you do want to come on this point? Yeah, thank you very much, Kavina. It was a couple of questions. Uh, one was really a supplement, uh, a supplementary to uh, what Kate Forbes was asking earlier about uh, support going forward, um, and again from the complainants point of view. Um, I take it that that support would obviously be provided, or albeit provided by an independent um, organisation, be funded by th this body, the government, and uh, sorry, the, the parliament, and it would be ongoing um, after the, the um, after resolution of the case, regardless of whether the case went in uh, the complainant's favour or not. Um, yes, I would say so independent specialist um, and yes it's not just about pre-making whatever complaint during the investigation and then post it as well um, and there is something about um, access to an independent specialist in that regard um, but also access to independent legal information and advice for instance and I mean, I will say that, you know, the Scottish Government does fund, unlike England and Wales, does fund the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. So, I mean, we are there to provide some, you know, legal information, etc. But there is a, 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 so in terms of access to support, there's that advocacy support, but also access to, to, to legal information as well. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I, I endorse what Kirsty said. Okay. And, and again, very kind of, Briefly, um, in previous sessions, um, the, the issue of the actual terminology of sexual harassment, I appreciate that the definition is laid out in the Equality Act 2010, but I imagine most people probably aren't particularly in favour of what the, the Equality Act 2010 um, defines it as. And I just wondered whether that term, terminology, harassment, would, would that be the ideal terminology to use, or does it give suggestions that perhaps it's... Um, uh, incidents, multiple incidents, or maybe over a prolonged period, is there, would there be a better term to use so that people didn't look at it and think, well, it was a one-off, th this isn't covered? And I'm just using anecdotal evidence of discussing this with particularly female friends of mine, and the number of them have said, well, actually, it does rather suggest it's, it's a multiple incidents or over a prolonged period. So it was just really your thoughts on, on the wording. Um, shall I yes. go first? Yes. Um, this actually comes up in, in a lot of areas. Of women's rights, um, where you have a, um, a, a concept or a definition, um, and then looking at the explanation of that definition in law, it actually doesn't mean much um, from a practical basis. And I'll say what I normally say when we look at changing a definition is that my 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 response would be no, um, because it is there in the Equality Act, um, and to continue to promote clarity, we should use the same term. However. Um, we should be doing far more work in terms of breaking that down. Um, and, um, and that's difficult to do, which is why it often isn't done. Um, and it's not just in this context, it's in many contexts. Um, and there is something about making it, it real um, and making it clear that it's not necessarily just one act. So I would caution against changing well-used terms but I would definitely say there is um, work needed, and from lawyers included. <laughs> it's too easy to go back to the Quality Act definition, but I myself had to read it, if you, you know, to actually break that down. That takes work, but it's necessary work, and it's work we shouldn't shy away from. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I think that's the reason why in any policy that you do have um, and the promotion of that policy, as well as the, the referring to the legal terminology, which I would use because it's easier to have that clear link 
with uh, legal obligations uh, and duties and so on. Um, but you also need to, to specify some good examples, again, included not just in my evidence, but in others from the TUC report of the types of behaviour that we're talking about uh, when we talk about sexual harassment. And I think that message has to be given loud and clear to all parts of any organisation, um, that that is actually what that, that terminology encapsulates. Um, so, sorry, so perhaps if we are trying to make, um, uh, again, particularly women, aware uh, that incidents are, are not okay with posters or whatever other awareness, we should be breaking that down and using examples and not necessarily relying on the, on the legal terminology. Absolutely, yeah. If I can add to that, as, as should all of us. Yeah. As should we, through the Scottish Women's Rights Centre, be trying to do that. I mean, it's, um, it's something for all of us, but it's it's nearly always what a woman will say when they phone or get in touch with us, I'm not sure what this is. Um, I really don't think it is this. Um, and it nearly, nearly always. Um, so so it's, it's not something that just affects sexual harassment. It's across the board. Thank you very much. Tom. Thank you. Good morning. It was just a follow-up to uh, Patrick Harvey's question. Um, on the idea of, of MSPs being subject to the uh, similar terms and conditions of employment law as anyone else would be, and for an ultimate sanction of dismissal, I just would be keen to hear views on whether this option of dismissal should be available to other breaches um, of what would be regarded as correct conduct, or what would be the gross misconduct in any other employment situation, which, while not harassment, might be commensurate in severity, such as persistent bullying, intimidation, assault, for example. Just in terms of actually, if we were to go to look at this in more detail, we would have to look more widely than just um, specifically on harassment. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's difficult to look at harassment. I mean, we do, uh, we've said all the way through this that we have to look at, at sexual harassment in isolation as a particular problem. But I think when you start thinking about sanctions, um, and um, changing the way in which MSP's behaviour is regulated, if that's the right way to put it, then I think, you, you, yes, it probably is something that you have to look at in a, more, in a broader context of behaviours. Yeah, and I think um, what, what the evidence has been saying to this committee is there's a need for clarity and coherency. And I guess that wouldn't be there if there was an ultimate sanction for, you know, for one piece of misconduct. And I guess in looking at that, yes, a broader review would require to be taken in order to make sure that there is coherency and, and that that would work, yes. So. Thank you. Alexander. Thank you, Camille. We've, we've touched on the problem and we've identified that in lots of cases there may be under-reporting. And that under-reporting has come because of the fear uh, that the individual may have about reprisals or... Uh, re-victimisation or incrimination that we come uh, uh, from reporting that behaviour. So it's trying to get the reassurance and what you would le make that reassurance happen within organisations so that individuals felt confident enough. Uh, and I think all this, the campaign we've had of recent has given people that chance to feel more confident. Uh, but this, but there, there are still people out there who think, mm, if I do this, what are the repercussions to me uh, in this process? I think that's very true. I mean, I think I think the public profile, if that's the, the right word to use, that these sorts of issues have had recently is very useful, but it's just a starting point. And I, you know, everyone's asking, is this a moment of change? I, I really, really hope it is. Um, but we are beginning to see how widespread, how pernicious, how difficult these issues are to deal with. Um, and so I wonder, we might have just touched the tip of an iceberg here. Um, and I do, I think uh, your point is, is well made that um, we have to be very careful in any procedures, any processes, uh, to minimise uh, fear of repercussion for the individual coming forward and reporting. Um, there are certain steps that can be taken, and good workplace policy on sexual harassment, again, could be used as sort of models of good practice on that. Um, so you would avoid making uh, the only line of reporting to a line manager, for example. You would also um, make sure, I think, in the engender evidence they speak about this, um, 
that there is a woman available to deal with complaints, uh, you know, or, or issues that might be raised um, for individuals, because they may find it much easier to report to a woman uh, than a, a male colleague or, or manager. Um, so there are certain things that can be done, and I think they can come from examples of good practice. There can come from good workplace policies, um, and there are examples out there. Um, but I think um, the underreporting isn't just to do with fear, it's also to do with lack of knowledge, it's also to do with a worry that nothing's going to happen, um, and it's also to do with um, uh, a perception that um, there is no sanction available that's suitable. And I think all of those things, and if we're going to build confidence and inspire confidence in uh, women within workplaces uh, and other um, contexts generally, we, we have to look at the full range, uh, not, not just around um, you know, who you report to and the fear of intimidation or, or some sort of victimisation occurring. Yes. <clears throat> and again, um, looking at it from the perspective of women who, who contact us, um, there is fear, yes, a fear of what, what could happen, the repercussions to them. Um, the repercussions to others around about them. Um, but it also comes from um, lack of information, knowledge, but a fear of the unknown. Um, if, if someone's going to instigate a process or, or a procedure, they wish to know what their rights are, at what point they can withdraw, what control do they have, and particularly over information and the direction. And where that's not clear, then a woman, for valid reasons, will tend not to enter into that process. Because if what we're talking about is a cause and consequence of power and power imbalance, if the actual process um, causes, causes that to happen, then it's not working. And often women will embark on something and will say, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know my information was going to be shared that way. I didn't understand that. And that's when people get um, dissatisfied, more than dissatisfied, and that's what puts other, other women off. So there is something about making it clear what would be expected, what level of control, what rights um, are available. And there is something very important in there about confidentiality. And I think that we talk about confidentiality and matters being confidential. But I think there is a slight fudging sometimes with that. Are we talking at all aspects for all levels of contact? Are we saying that there are some exceptions? What are those exceptions? Are we saying there are no exceptions? And again, making, making that clear at the start. And linked to that, if someone evaluates all that, they have all this information, they know what's going to happen, they know the, posit you know, the potential negatives at each stage and may not decide to report personally, then there should be access to a third party reporting mechanism, basically. And, and I think you know, the, the, the whole concept of having that third party independent person gives more confidence, uh, gives them the assurances that they're looking for. Uh, because as you've rightly identified, their online manager may not be the best person for them to go to. They may not have confidence in that is going to proceed in the right direction, or they feel that they may be challenged or even put in a worse situation by doing that uh, uh, and, and by bringing some organisation or individual who can look at it objectively and from outside uh, would also m maybe ensure that more people had that confidence and took that step uh, of coming forward and, and making the, uh, the situation clearer because, as I say, they've seen in the past maybe things haven't been quite so well managed within their own organisation and that's through lack of training and lack of understanding of, of the situation. Or, or it's not been given the gravitas that it needs to be given. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Kirsty Thompson and uh, Professor Busby for their evidence today. Um, I'm sure the committee has found that really valuable. And uh, I'll now suspend briefly to change witnesses.
Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, welcome our second panel for this morning. Uh, joining us are Amy Johnson, Policy and Research Officer of Zero Tolerance, and Caroline Thompson, Consultant of the Scottish Women's Convention. Thank you very much for coming along um, to share your expertise with us this morning. I wonder if I could maybe kick off with just asking a little bit about um, positive culture and how we achieve positive culture in the workplace and, and more broadly but also perhaps touching on some of what the last panel was talking about, if you have areas of good or best practice that you're able to share with the committee. Certainly. Um, thank you very much for giving Scottish Women's Convention this opportunity. Back on the 20th of January, um, we organised a conference on sexual harassment and we had about 150 women had registered for this conference. It was an awful morning and 120 women turned up so it was very very important to them and we were delighted by by the the, the turnout at that we had um, three speakers at that um, which was very interesting but what was more interesting was at um, at the end of the conference we had round tables we split out and we spoke about sexual harassment what it meant to the women and uh, the, the outcome of it um, that I thought was very interesting is um, a lot of the women said, if that's happening in, in, in the Scottish Parliament, what's happening in the ordinary workplace? And they said, um, so the, the Scottish Parliament needs to be our role model. Um, they, they have a role in leading the way and, and create a healthy culture for MSPs, staff, visitors, etc. And the message was the culture culture change has to come from the top and also all political parties should come together in this um, and show uh, some unity. Um, so Scottish Women's Convention taking all this information um, suggests that there should be um, a, a recruitment or identify a person or persons within the Scottish Government that individuals can approach, um, that they, they will be eventually experts in the field, maybe accreditation involved, but definitely some training. In addition, there definitely, as we said earlier, need to work with external partners um, for legal advice and, and, and for further support. Um, so that in addition to that, um, and, and it was covered off earlier in great detail, um, speaking to the women on the morning and taking all that information they've given us, it looks to us that a, a code of conduct, some sort of statement should be created. And that, um, and in a, the standards and conduct rules should be in place. And that is how we how we behave and the definition of sexual harassment. Obviously, a separate policy, and a, and, and again, um, a sort of um, endorse what was said earlier. How we do things, that is the expectations, the process, the procedures that should be followed, and agreed with trade unions if necessary. That should uh, that should include. Um, appeals, disciplinary, grievance, confidentiality, reporting arrangements, I'll, the, the list goes on. Um, and I think if you've got that down, that is a great base for expanding and, and improving the culture. Can I ask then, when you were talking about a specific person to go to, yes. were you uh, talking about the same thing as the previous panel was talking about, as, as someone identified? Someone as... identified, not necessarily the line manager, because the line manager could, could, is where they could have the issue, but have someone internal that they could that they could approach. That person doesn't necessarily need to be aware of all the, the legalities of the situation, but they can give them comfort, support, and lead them to where they should be going and they should be knowledgeable of, of, of the actual process, policy and procedures. Amy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, please. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, 
I think the first step is acknowledging, and this has been discussed previously, that sexual harassment doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's part of a continuum of inequality and violence that women face. And therefore, if we're eradicating or preventing it, we need to examine this entire continuum, and that's every aspect of how a place of work operates. So it's pay gap, it's uh, per new, per new leave for new parents. We need to consider um, sort of the induction processes that staff have when they first arrive, and the sort of the the culture um, and experience that happens, not in formal settings, but informal settings around the workplace. Um, so it's every single aspect. It can't just be one excellent policy. Um, building on the point um, that my colleague made about having one individual that um, can be approached, I think if this person is trained in all equalities issues, and that training is made uh, clear, it's publicised, it's communicated to the entire body within the workplace so that they know that this person um, has this experience and is, is going to approach the situation respectfully with their safety at the forefront of the, the system. Um, just an example of something that we're doing in partnership with Rape Crisis Scotland about culture change in schools is the whole schools approach. Um, and within that, we're working with young people to examine every single th aspect of the school. So it's not just the policies, because a policy can be great, but if something's happening within the curriculum, it's going to be problematic. So it's that kind of full whole parliament approach that needs to happen. Um, and again, high profile ambassadors that are willing to speak out on this issue are willing to talk about bystander intervention and who can be clear focal points for everybody else within the parliament. And, Ambassadors from sort of different departments, different walks of life within the parliament. Um, and fi excuse me, finally, any, um, any holistic approach needs to, and that, that is tackling sexual harassment, needs to consider the fact that sexual harassment is based around power. And um, inequalities between genders aren't the only power that exists. Um, there's other power um, imbalances that are the result of discrimination based on race, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, migrant status, and disabled women or disabled people. And this can compound experiences of sexual harassment. And there's not enough evidence on this. There's not enough data collected around um, the experiences of people who have multiple uh, protected characteristics, but that's something that should be considered when tackling a, or when changing and, and improving a whole culture is those people's experiences and making sure that they have a voice in the process. Um, and then just two statistics that came from Zero Tolerance's 2016 survey on sex, women's experience of sexual harassment in the workplace is 42% of respondents said they were experiencing negative gender stereotyping on a daily basis. So it's, it's huge, and that negative gender stereotyping, that plays straight into sexual harassment. And 77% of respondents thought that employers um, could and should influence the culture to improve it. So the, the appetite is definitely there, and as you said, it should probably be top down. Okay, thank you. Any of the committee want to come in at this point? Kate. Someone else? No. no. Um, going back to a question that we asked earlier about the clear policies and then implementation. So you've talked there about the wider culture and the wider context. What, what restricts or what are the, the major challenges of implementing clear policies? Is it a cultural issue? Is it a fact that we've not really been tackling this properly in the past? Is it a third reason? The challenges of implementing clear policies. Yeah, so it's, it's fairly straightforward, perhaps, to sit around a table and to draft uh, a really nice sounding policy, much more difficult to actually implement it. And we heard in the earlier panel about <clears> the failures of implementation. What, in your view, drives that failure to implement? Um, I could give an, an example taken from our conference, um, a, a, a person working in a, a large organisation, um, large Scottish organisation, and their policies are implemented by video. And each of their policies, they've got to actually physically watch this video and they've got to sign off that they have actually 
saw this video and understood this video and they have to do it on an annual basis. So to me that is a clear implementation. You know everybody has seen it and if, and, and um, it's, it's said to them if they do not understand any part of this to go and see their line manager who will contact HR. I suppose that's that's one way of of implementation of ensuring implementation. I think um, communication and training. So making sure that they're very clearly communicated in an accessible way, um, and that you know in this setting, all the complexity of a policy that might exist within the parliament, that complexity is no longer the responsibility of the person who would wish to report, but is absorbed by the parliament as an employer. Um, so making the policy as clear as possible, but acknowledging that the complexity will be handled um, adequately. And then I think training for those that are implementing it as well is absolutely key. Um, and again, making sure that training is articulated to, to everybody. So they know that the people that will be responding to them have been trained in equalities, have been trained in um, acknowledging that other forms of discrimination might interplay with the sexual harassment that the, the person reporting has faced, um, that they have been trained on disclosure and confidentiality and yeah, making sure that the training is really robust and comprehensive and that the training has been communicated out as well so that people trust the policy and the process. Okay, Ian Patrick. Um, thanks very much. Um, good morning. I wanted to, to come on to sanctions and uh, I know that you were, you were both in the room for the previous panel discussion so I won't go through the whole run up to it again but complex landscape uh, parliament's corporate staff third party organizations visitors msps political parties msp staff different approaches to uh, to these the, the different scenarios that might arise and the msps themselves ourselves as a particular category of people for whom there's a, a separate code of conduct and, and complaint procedures um, do you want to respond to those issues that I discussed with the, the previous panel? Uh, have a, a, a different or, or additional view to anything that came up there? Um, one sort of very short statement to make, and that has my sort of previous experiences when you look at policies and um, they talk about um, behaviours and not adhering to the policy, this may lead to dismissal. So, you know, that statement is there in itself. Obviously, there's lots of layers before you reach that, but it is included. Anything else? I would add that um, I recognise the complexities, and um, especially if it's third party or contractors, but if it's anybody that's working within the parliament that the person who has been sexually harassed will, inter will have to interact with again in any way, shape or form, if dismissal isn't... Um, an option, then the person that's being sexually harassed is being sanctioned by having to interact with that person by not feeling safe. So it's just something to be very aware of, that if you can't dismiss somebody, how are you keeping the person that was sexually harassed safe? Are they able to still come to work? Are they able to remain in employment? Because that's something we've heard repeatedly in the evidence is women having to leave employment while the person that sexually harassed them is still in employment. Um, so yeah, but it's something to grapple with, but I think the, issue, the word sanction is an important one because if you're not sanctioning the person that's done it, are you potentially sanctioning the person that's had to come forward, go through this entire process and then is now working um, probably with a power imbalance with the person that sexually harassed them or having to see them and having to hear gossip. So it's, um, it's a powerful way to describe the problem. Um, <laughs> it's not we, necessarily we need to. Though. We need to... Um, you know, Westminster, as I said in the in the previous session, have tried to find a solution with the, the power of recall. Probably not designed specifically for this situation, though, or for this issue. And the the previous panel uh, shared the view that turning a situation like like a, a complaint around sexual harassment into a public campaign would be inappropriate. Would lead to inconsistency in results and lack of clarity for somebody making a complaint in the first place. Probably not the right solution for this issue. Um, MSPs, if a very serious incident took place that in, in other workplaces might result in, in dismissal, um, you have the court of public opinion, I guess, you have the, the light of media scrutiny. 
potentially if there's a breach of the code of conduct and that has to be well defined there's a complaint that would be investigated by the commissioner then come to this committee and ultimately would have to go to the whole parliament for a vote um again that's a a very different kind of process than you would expect in other workplaces um can either of you boil it down to the, the core principles about what kind of procedure is necessary if that ultimate backstop is to be used? Um, because it seems to me that it's not consistent with what we've got at the moment, the, the code of conduct, and not consistent with the the only other option that, that Westminster has explored so far. Can, can we boil it down to how does that process need to happen in order for it to be a legitimate part of, of a response to this kind of situation? I mean, very robustly. <laughs> I think um, relatively independently as well. Um, it would need to be a body that was probably from the beginning of the process um, supporting the process, supporting the person that's reporting and investigating who was somewhat independent um, and that the checks and balances were in place to make sure that the decision of that process was was secure and was correct yeah so, so we're really talking about here a, a, a robust and sound grievance appeals process and the, the ultimate outcome okay is there anything else either of you want to say about the range of sanctions that that might be short of that ultimate backstop the, the range of sanctions we have available and uh, whether any changes to the, the code of conduct are, are necessary in, in relation to that. Prevention has to be um, at the forefront of all the sanctions. If, if the person is dismissed, it's to prevent them from doing it again and to prevent further harm to the person who has experienced the sexual harassment. Any lesser um, sanctions would also should also have prevention at the forefront of why, why it's been done. So if the person... Um, is remaining in work, are they being asked to go through a process of um, education about why their actions were not okay? I think that would have to be a requirement. I think um, other possibilities around the, the parliament as an employer, if this is a ha having the opportunity to say this is not okay, this case is not okay, um, and the people that have experienced it, having that, you know, being able to see that their employer acknowledges that this is not okay has to be part of that because that's part of prevention as well as having that clear line of this is unacceptable. Okay. Thank you both very much. Alexander. We, we, we've touched on culture uh, and, and that's a very difficult thing to manage in, in this whole process. But when you look at examples of low level, which may just be a joke or a, a, a comment, uh, you then get medium level, which may be a little bit more discriminatory and then the highest level. It, some individuals go through that journey uh, when it starts at low level and it progresses and they, they take it on board and think, well, it's okay at that level. But as it moves up uh, and, the, and the individual is, is victimised or progressed, I mean, it would be interesting to see what are your views of that process? Have many people said that it's a journey, uh, that it starts and then progresses, or is there a, a, a means to that process, a means to that end? The, the evidence we have is that it's off, it is a journey, um, and it might not all be. It might not be the same person that's doing it to you, but that's your. That's an. Ex it, and it, there are situations when that's not the case as well. When it's just a very significant experience of sexual harassment as the first stop. Um, when it is a journey, and for most women, they that in Scotland will have experienced some form of. Um, harassment based on their gender it's hard to then acknowledge when it's impacting you in a way because you've, you've just normalized it and you've accepted that you've internalized it um, and it shouldn't always have to be up to the person that's experiencing whatever form of discrimination to say this isn't okay like i it's it there needs to be within the culture of the parliament as a workplace but as within scottish culture just much more emphasis on other people who see things being like this is not okay and being able to step in in a way that de-escalates the situation that respects the person that's experiencing it you know not yelling necessarily at the person that's saying it but saying are you okay look that's that's unacceptable are you okay can we do something for you and i think that's something that needs to be built upon and, and developed further um 
Um, one, one of the questions we asked at our conference um, to the women was, what does sexual harassment mean to you? And the, the responses were just night and day, um, depending on what round table you were at. So some women, are, 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 as you described, low level, you know, would consider that sexual harassment, other women wouldn't. So, you know, you've got that to con consider as well. But the overall message is that all inappropriate verbal, physical, etc., um, abuse is not acceptable and women want it to stop now. And that was the, the message that came over. Having the, the poster, the campaign, the visual uh, when people arrive in a building, when people come to a building for the first time and others who are in the building or whatever the context is, by having that, did that create a, a better culture that people felt, OK, it's been identified, it's been looked at, it's been used? Just by having some of these symbols and adver advertisements or posters and lifts or whatever it might be? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And, and you're giving them a, a safe environment to speak out as well, um, which... Um, and you know you, you you're um, you're reassuring them that something's going to be done with this information as well. So you know that, that there's a path that, that they want to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of what I was going to ask has actually just been covered uh, there because obviously in the previous session um, we talked about the terminology and, and and I was going to ask you about kind of practical um, impact on that and practical solutions for um, you know looking at the term sexual harassment whether you know whether that needed to change and also how you make sure that people feel they're in a safe environment to report so, so as a lot of that's being covered obviously feel free to add any, to, anything else to that um as, as you will but um i wanted to ask about this point of contact we'll just go back to that that, me that, that message you that, that thing you said earlier um that was that you were looking for somebody who would have experience uh, or the ability or understanding or training on a, vi a wide variety of different um issues quality issues whether it's um issues around disability or, um, or other such similar um, uh, issues. I was just wondering, because of um, the need for people to feel, feel comfortable when reporting, would you envisage that you would need uh, a, a woman and a man to do, um, to do those jobs so that people could report issues regardless of their gender? Um, or would you think if that was a first point of call, you, you, might, you might be able to have just one person? Our thoughts around the Scottish Women's Convention when it was being discussed, our thoughts was not even particularly one person, persons, you know. So do 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 you give do you give um, certain policies to one person, certain policies to other, or do they all know everything about each policy? So we're not talking about one individual here, um, possibly not even a team, but um, more than one individual. And yes, I think you've got to, to, to consider diversity, because when you when, when you strip it back, obviously we're talking about um, sexual harassment um, to women, but we've obviously both parties have got to be protected too. Um, so you know, so the the the, ma the man who's been accused, what support is he going to be offered in this process as well? So obviously, all of that's got to be considered. I would agree that a woman has to be one of the points um, for reporting because even from cultural reasons, for cultural reasons or religious reasons, discussing things like about like sexual harassment, it should be a woman that a woman can approach. Um, but I would agree as well that it shouldn't necessarily just be one person. Um, a woman and a man would be a good idea. But um, more so than that, it, they you know the fact that they are really well trained and that this is this is their focus, this is their priority, this is what they do, and that they're there to advise you. I'm not sure whether this person should be that initial point and then advice and communication, or if they would be empowered to take the investigation further. That would be another discussion. But this um, this team or this individual should be very, very well trained and that training needs to be communicated to anybody who might be wanting to report an instance of sexual harassment to them. Um, and then I would also add that the ways in which harassment can be reported should be, should be inclusive and accessible. So face-to-face um, -face would work for a lot of people, would make a lot of people feel safer, but some people would prefer to do it over email, some people might prefer to do it over phone, and it also might be dependent on what they 
what they can do, the time, where they are when they're having to report this sexual harassment. So I think there should be a variety of ways to report to this individual, to these people. Can I ask just very, 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 quick, very quickly as well, the, the, that person you would could could have a, a, a wider role than just the initial point of contact, so they maybe would act as a support throughout the, um, the process. You suggested that they might actually take the process on as well, depending, so it wouldn't just be essentially a, somebody to signpost to better, you know, better advice or more, more sustained support? I would say that they should be certainly there throughout the process to be that point of communication. So I think communicating at every stage of the process, at the beginning of the process, to say this is what will happen. Um, this is maybe not what will happen, but what can happen if you want to take the next step. Um, and then this is the time scale we're looking at. This is the stages at which certain points of um, process will occur. I think that more, more than the investigative process, more the communication of the investigation is um, the priority. Okay. And I'm just thinking of one more tier support. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Amy Johnson and Caroline Thompson for coming along to the committee today. Um, I'm sure the committee's found your, your evidence very interesting and um, will feed into our, our eventual uh, um, report. Um, so we'll now uh, move into private session as previously agreed.